Good morning. We shall all have to sing very, very loud today since there are so few of us. But given the circumstances, I am so glad that you are here. Let me make you aware of a few things for the life of our congregation. Uh, you'll find a full printout of the announcement that we've made regarding our practices uh, since we have had one or two of our members test positive for COVID. The thing the executive committee wanted to stress is that your participation at some events is absolutely your choice, is a it, depending on your mask. comfort level. We're going to encourage people to mask, to be socially distanced, uh, but if you're not comfortable being present, that is fine. But for some events that we do hold here, if you're comfortable, we welcome you. You can see on the back side of your announcements that a number of things have already been canceled uh, as a result of this. And uh, I will say that um, we will try to have Bible study this coming Wednesday evening. I think we can appropriately distance in the fellowship hall and mask up if necessary. So we will plan to go forward with that for the time being. As well, uh, we will also be doing our soup supper in a few weeks, and uh, it will be a drive-through soup supper as we have previously done uh, during COVID. And there is a sign-up sheet, I believe, in the Narthex if you wish to volunteer or if you wish to provide something uh, for that time. Is a demonstration uh, we have no case. word yet on when our refugee family is going to be uh, in town, but nonetheless, we are still receiving donations of goods and items. There is a box out in the narthex, and you can make those donations as you see fit. So I think that about covers the announcements. And so with that, oh, must remind you that next Sunday, there will be a, uh, a uh, congregational uh, vote for new members of our executive uh, committee. And the nominees are Jocelyn Borgers, Jerry Crosno, Susan Bowling. And Luna uh, will, will be up again for a term as the assistant treasurer. We will make arrangements for those who cannot be present to register their vote, uh, and we'll, we'll try to get the word on how that's going to work uh, for you. We'll get that out in the coming week. But should you be here, please be aware that that is uh, our intention is to carry on with that vote. All right. My wife sends you her regards. She has been on call and she's been filling in for another chaplain uh, this week and uh, she just simply needed a Sabbath. So she sends you her love. She's fine. She's just dog tired. So, um, uh, I told her that uh, you would miss her very, very much, this that uh, of uh, she misses you. So as we prepare for our worship and for our call to worship, give ear to these words from the prophet Isaiah. Regarding Zion, I can't keep my mouth shut. Regarding Jerusalem, I can't hold my tongue. Until her righteousness blazes like the sun and her salvation flames up like a torch. Foreign countries will see your righteousness and world leaders your glory. You'll get a brand new name straight from the mouth of God. You'll be a stunning crown in the palm of God's hand, a jeweled gold cup held high in the hand of your God. No more will anyone call you rejected, and your country will no more be called ruined. You'll be called Hephzibah, my delight, and your land, Beulah, married, because God delights in you, and your land will be like a wedding celebration. For as a young man marries his virgin bride, so your builder marries you. And as a bridegroom is happy in his bride, so your God is happy with you. 
And with that, would you stand now and join me in the call to worship and our opening hymn. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. God, we gather today believing that your power is at work within us. God's power is so strong, it can accomplish more than we can ask or imagine. So let us not be timid in our asking. Give us courage to ask for great things. Let us dare to dream big dreams and imagine a bright future so that your glory may be revealed in your church and in all the world. Amen. Please note we'll be singing verses 1, 3, 4, and 5 of hymn number 389. can be seated. I'm going to trust that some of our young friends are looking in on this service uh, via our stream. But if not, today you are all my young friends. So, what I have here is a glass. And it's got some water in it. Can you see that? So is that all there is? Nope. What? Air. Ingredients in the water, H2O. Other than that, Jerry, it really might not be water. It might be gin or vodka. You just don't know, do you? Well, I thought I'd offer it to you. <laughs> Well, thought I actually thought we'd pass around and see if we could get a little Pentecostal this morning. You know how we look at things, don't you? We just say, well, that's a glass of water. That's what it is, and that's all it can be. In the gospel story this morning, we're going to talk about Jesus at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. And I think perhaps you're well aware of the story, but Jesus took something that was pretty ordinary, water. And he looked at it and said, you know, it's more than just H2O, more than just some air at the top of the container. And really, it's more than water. It has the potential in my hands to become something no one ever dreamed. And you know the story. Jesus turned water into a very fragrant, rich, and 
savory wine. And so the whole idea today as we think about this story and as we hopefully listen to the sermon is to say, you know, maybe we need to start looking more deeply into something and recognizing that there is more possibility and more potential present than we ever knew. Water can become wine. All right. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Is it half full or half empty? What do you think? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it, could, it could be either one of those things. And again, it has to do with what do you see? What do you see? Half full? Half full? Half empty? Um, of wire you know, you could say, well, it's a plastic cup, and on the back side, there's writing, but, you know, it's what you see. And part of being in faith, literally, <coughs> opening their eyes to see and to see more. Before I move on to the morning psalm, any other comments? All right. Our reading from Psalms comes from Psalm 36, verses 5 through 10. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your ring, wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. And in your light, we see light. Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. This is a demonstration of Wirecast.
As we prepare to offer our prayers this morning, I would like to ask a personal favor of you today. Uh, one of our dearest friends uh, this is, a demonstration is of losing not. his wife uh, to a battle to cancer, and she has only one to two weeks to live. And her name is Linda Klein, and I would invite you, if you're so uh, motivated to remember her, her husband Steve. Uh, they are very gracious and good people, and uh, our prayers is that as death claims her, um, she would not have to face test. any undue suffering or, or great pain. We have others that we're remembering today. Michelle is recovering for, some, for joint replacement on her thumb. And then, as you well know, we have some folks that are <clears throat> uh, trying to to uh, cope with the fact that they have tested positive for COVID and some have symptoms to varying degrees. And I know that they would appreciate your concern and your care for them. So with that, would you bow with me as we pray? Of Wirecast. Lord, in the written words of Scripture, we are told that your light shines in the darkness. And no matter how deep and thick the darkness is, it can never, ever overcome the light. In so many ways, Lord, we feel engulfed and surrounded by shadows. Once again, we have found our lives kind of tossed on their ear because of this virus that just never does seem to go away. Once again, we have had to alter our routines. But that's not the worst of it, Lord. People that we know, people we care about deeply, they face great struggles. And Lord, when we search our own hearts, we know that our lives are not always full of bright and brilliant light. There can be shadows, deep shadows, that caress our own souls. And at times, Lord, we feel as though we're about to give in and give way to the darkness. Help us to see your light. Of wire Let us hold fast to that light, whether it is a pinprick in the distance or a brilliant spotlight shining with tremendous illumination. Let us believe and hold to the fact that indeed you, even though we can't always see the evidence of it, you are overcoming the forces of darkness. You are overpowering everything that would seek to diminish us and make us less than who you want us to be. We pray today, Lord, that the light you give us would be enough to light our path and that that light would indeed be the source of our hope, our strength, and our faith. We offer before you the struggles of our own souls. We try very hard to follow your path, Lord. Is a demonstration of we do path. want to be your followers. But we confess there are times that we step off the path. We take detours. We get our attention snagged by something that lures us away from the promise of your kingdom. We are not perfect, but we're grateful, Lord, that your grace is indeed perfect and complete. Remind us yet again in the words of the Apostle Paul that where our sin abounds, grace is all the more abundant. And let us take courage from that. Grant us in response the gift of your peace, and the assurance that we are indeed
forgiven. And now, Lord, we pause to name in your presence the concerns that press upon us quite heavily, the needs that we know of, people whom we love and care for. We hold them now up into your light as we name their names. is a demonstration of Wirecast. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Now let us join together, praying as Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Our reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the second chapter. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they fill them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, although the, the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said, This is a demonstration of wine. Everyone serves the good wine first. And then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you, you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And his disciples 
believed in him. Would you pray with me, please? Of Wirecast. Lord, it is so tempting for us to read this story as though it is something that merely happened a long time ago. Remind us that you are not done and that what happened then can happen now. We pray, Lord, that you would so work in us this is a demonstration that of all God. that you see within us might be unlocked and that we could indeed fulfill the dreams that you have for us and the potential that you have given to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. How often do we hear someone say this? Is a of it is what it is. It is what it is. Usually that's the comment of someone who has taken a hard-headed look at reality and said, we can come to no other conclusion. There are no other options, no other possibilities. It just is what it is. Maybe that's someone who is totaling up how the business has done in the last year and the balance sheet at the end of the year, despite whatever hopes the owner of that business might have had for profit as opposed to loss, they look at the final numbers and say, well, it's not what I hoped for, it's not what I wanted, but guess what? It is what it is. Or maybe we just say those words to ourselves when we refuse to allow ourselves uh, the comfort of our illusions. Maybe we have to do that hard work when someone we love, someone we care about, we realize that finally they are slanted toward death and death is going to overtake them. There are no more treatment options and somewhere along the line, Maybe not in these terms, but the family has to begin to come to grips with reality and say, it is what it is. It is not what I hoped. It is not what I prayed, but it is what it is. Fortunately for us, Jesus did not buy into that take on reality. As the Gospel of John puts it, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the wedding was in danger of becoming a disaster. The wine was about to give out. Now, in that day and time, weddings could be long and protracted affairs. They could last for up to a week. Guests were invited to weddings and they knew sort of the rough timetable of when the wedding would happen and they were allowed to come to the wedding feast, the wedding celebration on their own schedule. It wasn't something that you scheduled and said it's gonna happen on Saturday afternoon or Saturday night, wedding and reception and then it's all over. No, we're having the wedding and the party is going to go on for as long as it takes for all of our friends and all of our loved ones to come and to show up. And it was the responsibility of the bride to make In more ways than one, I have a low battery. Can you hear me? All right. It was the responsibility of the wedding party to ensure that there was enough food and enough wine for however long the wedding might go. And so if they ran out of something, particularly the wine, well, that would be a cause of great embarrassment and great This is a 
a demonstration of Wirecast. I can't talk loud enough for you to hear me. How's that? Luna, am I good? All right. So, somehow, Jesus' mother was privy to this state of affairs. And so when Jesus and his disciples showed up for the wedding, she kind of took Jesus by the elbow and pulled him aside and said, they have no wine. Subtly suggesting, you ought to do something about this. You ought to fix this. And Jesus looked at his mother and said, hey, my hour has not yet come. It's just not time for me to be doing this kind of stuff. But somewhere along the line, Jesus changed his mind and recognized that in this moment, he had an opportunity to make a statement about his ministry. Of and so Jesus seized the initiative. He told the stewards to fill these huge stone pots all the way to the top with water. And then he said, just draw some out and take it to the master of ceremonies for the wedding. Well, they did. And the master of ceremonies took the wine that they offered. He sipped it. He savored it. And then he just lit up and said, wow, this is wonderful. And he called the bridegroom and set him front and center before the wedding party. And he said, may I have your attention? I have an announcement to make. I want to commend the bridegroom for his ingenious and generous hospitality. He said, most folks serve the good wine first. And then when all the guests have been drunk, they bring out the bad stuff. But you, you have done exactly the opposite. You have saved the best for now. Now, supposing we were guests at that wedding, and supposing we had savored that wonderful wine, and supposing we had said, you know, we'd like to get some of that. And so what if we had made our way to the stewards and said, can you tell me where you got this? Where did this come from? What would have been our response when the stewards just pointed to those large jars and said, it's just water? What would we have said? No way. That just doesn't happen. Water always stays water. After all, it is, is what it is. Water just doesn't become wine. But as I said, Jesus didn't buy into that, and he didn't operate like that all throughout his ministry. Jesus always looked at things a little differently. And he looked at things not in terms of what they are, but instead of what they could become. A demonstration of and he did the same with people all the time. Take Peter. Jesus called Peter and said, I want you to be one of my followers. And Peter said, yes. And here's what we know about Peter. Peter was mercurial. He could be unstable. He could have tremendous highs. And when he did, he just flew. But Peter could also descend to the depths and plunged to the lowest of lows. Peter was prone to promising way more than he could deliver. He could act as though he was the bravest soul ever around, and then his spine would turn to sand when somebody called him. And so if we had been around, and we were saying, you know, 
We're going to start an organization. We're going to start some kind of movement. And if Peter had showed up for a job interview, what we would have said was, he's not for us. He is an entirely too unstable. We just can't count on him. But Jesus looked at Peter and saw something different. And that's why Jesus gave Peter the name Rock. You may not act like Rock right now, Jesus said, but I see enough within you to know what you can become. And I want you to know, Peter, that I have great dreams for you. And as a matter of fact, you're going to become so strong, so rock-like, that when I leave the scene, you are going to get things started in my absence. You are going to carry on when I am not here. Jesus looked at Peter and did not see what he was. Jesus looked at Peter and said, this is what you can become. And the same thing happened with the woman taken in adultery. That's that wonderful story you find in the 8th chapter of John. This woman had a history of being used by men. And as John tells it, she was still being used by men, this time by the religious leaders and the religious authorities who cared nothing for her. They simply wanted to use her as a test case so they could indict and bring charges against Jesus. And so they bring this woman, taken in the very act of adultery. They throw her into the ground before Jesus' feet and they say, hey, who sinned? This woman is a sinner. She needs to be stoned. That's what the law says. What do you say? This is a demonstration. And Jesus of took cast. one look at this woman whose garments were torn, her hair was matted, she had tears running down her face, she expected the worst, and Jesus looked at this woman and did not see a sinner. Jesus saw someone who, for whatever reason, had been forced for so many years to live beneath the dignity that she truly possessed. And Jesus looked at her and said to all of those gathered around, I've got a different picture of her than you do. I know when you look at her, all you can say and think is, she's a sinner, she's a sinner, she's a sinner. I look at her and say, yes, but there's more there, and it certainly doesn't deserve to be killed. And then Jesus looked at that woman full in the face this and said, they may the condemn you, but I don't. I think you're capable of much more. So get up. Let's just stop this fooling around you're doing because you are way, way better than that. Jesus looked at this woman and saw way more than his friends and contemporaries did. Jesus did not this see just what she cast. was. Jesus saw all that she could become. We have a habit even within church, of saying it is what it is. We have to face reality. And I certainly understand how important that is. We can't live simply on false hope. But there is a time within the life of the congregation, and certainly for us, this individually, of to recognize that what we see with our eyes possesses far more potential than we dream to imagine. And that's what God sees when he looks at all of you. That's what God sees when God looks at this congregation. Oh, I know. You'll want to say, hey, let me tell you about the past. Or let me tell you about what it used to be like. And I know that you'll want to say, hey... 
We could try that, but we've tried it before and it won't work. Or we're just too small and that out there is just too big. Or let me tell you that, you know, I wish we could tackle that, but we just don't have the resources. We just don't have enough of what that takes. And so we're liable to just to shake our heads and say, it is what it is. May I remind you, my dear brothers and sisters, that on that wonderful day, centuries ago, God did not look down on a tomb covered over by a stone and simply walk away and say, it is what it is. God instead said, no, everybody else sees death here. I see life. I see potential. I see something that is incredible. And I am going to do some kind of incredible work, roll that stone out of the way, and Jesus is going to walk out. It is not what it is. In the face of death, there is life. And so for us, even though we have to postpone having conversation about what it takes for us to move from here to tomorrow, I want you to know that God looks at all of us and doesn't shake his head and said, Done. It is what it is. No. God looks at all of us and says, Wow. What can be? And my hope, my prayer, is that we will learn to look at ourselves and learn to look at things. of Wirecast. The way God looks at things. Oh yeah, take that hard-headed assessment, this is what it is, but also daring to believe this is what it could be. And can be. And if we do that, if we dare to take that step, some way, somehow, someone in this community or someone, some way, somehow, beyond what we know will take a look at us and come say to us these wonderful, wonderful words. Wow. You have saved the best for now. Amen. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Our hymn of commitment is 693. Would you stand as we sing together?
my dear brothers and sisters, few in number, glad we are here together. And now as you leave and depart this place, know through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, God looks upon you and has such great dreams. And so as you leave this place, decide now that you will do whatever you can to make that dream come true. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is a demonstration of Wirecast.